all themes as we prepare for the season of Lent, and I want you to make sure you're taking notes today because I want to really break this down and, and, and really get this to you. Uh, uh, as we prepare for the season of Lent is repentance. Everyone say repentance. repentance. It is a time for the church universal, not just the church in the West or in the Western Hemisphere or the United States, but the church worldwide, both in the Western Hemisphere uh, and the Eastern Hemisphere. It is a time when the church universal begins to pray and spends a lot of time praying and in contemplation uh, as we reflect and prepare for the resurrection season in the body of Christ. It is a time of repentance. It's a time of prayer. It's a time of fasting. It's a time of consecration in which you are focused on the things of God and you are using time accurately to spend time with him to review and reflect on your life. Yes. And so as we enter this time of repentance, as we enter this time, uh, we understand that Jesus makes some very startling statements, some very nebulous statements in the beginning of John's gospel, specifically in chapter 15. And I want to connect somewhat uh, uh, and lay a foundation from the songs that we have read and then begin to build according to John's gospel in this particular passage of scripture. Uh, uh, if there are two areas that the church is seriously lacking today, especially in the world, uh, we are lacking wisdom. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we are also lacking worship. Yes. Worship does not just occur on a Sunday morning experience. Worship does not just occur uh, uh, during a midweek Bible study or a class. Worship is a lifestyle for the believer. Uh, uh, we are finding today, especially in the increasing complexity of our time, that it is in, it's very rare to see those who possess what the scripture calls as a spiritual gift, the word of wisdom. So when we have a lack of something, we can only find the solution in the word of God. And I want you to hear me clearly this morning. I've said it before, but I'm going to reiterate it again. The more things change, the more we cling to things that don't change. The more things change. If you have to write down, make sure you do. The more we cling to things that don't change. And the word of God speaks to us despite the circumstances we are in. And so we are experiencing a lack of wisdom. And a lack of genuine godly worship. And so when we understand, you know, we understand the kind of these two things, we understand and recognize that wisdom emerges from the book of Proverbs. But worship emerges from the book of Psalms. So when we look at worship, we see the Psalms. The Psalms are, are, are the hymn book really is the hymn book of the church itself. Of course we know that in, in traditional uh, uh, reverse respects of church there are specific songs that we sing and all of that, but the hymns come from the Psalter. And so I want to make my case this morning to, to really look at why the songs are important. Because we don't really hear much about the song. Uh, we know about the 23rd Psalm, and I'm, it's new time, I'm going to really break down some of the 23rd Psalm. We've heard some of the 23rd Psalm, we've heard some other songs uh, growing up as a child. They might have had you recite some psalms, or if you've never been to church before, uh, you might have heard a psalm on television or somewhere quoted. Might have thought it was Shakespeare, but it was a song. We've heard psalms somewhere before, but they seem to have been excluded from the worship. And so, uh, I want to look at, uh, uh, for a couple of things, I want to write this down. I, 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 there's something I want to I wanna really get into. Uh, because when we look at the Psalms, especially as the Lord laid this song in my heart this morning for you as I began to pray and ponder all week long. And then everything I was going to preach changed early this morning uh, because he, he wanted to get something to you. Uh, uh, there is something very special uh -huh. about the song. The first thing I want us to understand, the first thing I want us to understand this morning is that the Psalms speak to us. The Psalms speak to us. The Psalms speak to us. It's almost as if the writer of the Psalms 
which are various. There's some written by David. There's some written by Asaph. There's one written by Moses. There are various persons, the sons of Korah, that write songs. But it's like when you read some of the songs, you, you find exactly what you're experiencing in the songs. Uh, uh, questions that are asked. You'll find that the two most commonly quoted books of the Old Testament in the New Testament is the prophet Isaiah and the book of Psalms. Jesus, while he's hanging on the cross, sits up on the cross and asks, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Echoing the words of David in the song. Uh -huh. As he stands and he's literally there, we understand the first thing that the Psalms speak to us. But the second thing we find is that the Psalms speak for us. Yes. When you find no words to say, Psalms can speak for your situation. When you find yourself cast down, the Psalms will begin to receive and speak to you. Why are you cast down? Uh, the Psalms speak for us. Uh, it was Athanasius uh, who said in the first century that the Psalms have a unique place in the Bible. Because most of the scripture speaks to us. I'm going somewhere. While the Psalms speak for us. I'm going to say it again. He says most of the scripture speaks to us. Where the Psalms speak for us. The psalmist describes the elements of the human deliverer. The trials, the tests, the circumstances. Uh, uh, we've been in a storm, been personally in a storm even over the last year. Uh, dealing with so many challenges and things uh, uh, from a ministry and that's all perspective and all kinds of things that were going on. And I would turn to the Psalms. And it was as if David himself was sitting by my side and talking to me. The Psalms speak for us. But the third thing that the Psalms do. The third thing that the Psalms do, the Psalms speak to us out of the depths. Out of the depths. Out of the depths. Uh, one of the Psalms, Clarice, that we understand and recognize is called Lament Psalms. And these are Psalms of frustration. And whenever you've been frustrated, Whenever you've been tired, whenever fear has struck your life, whenever something has happened that you did not expect, the psalmist begins to lament and ask the question, why? So, psalms are not just a book for prayer, but they are a pattern for worship. So let's, let's really examine what the psalmist says specifically in Psalms 92. And I want to look really carefully at this 13th verse. He says, those who are planted, everybody say planted, planted. in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Now this song, of course, was with reference to and context of the song to worship. It is a song for worship, as Israel would gather for worship. But what you must also understand is that he was trying to get something through to them, and he's reminding them that in order for you to flourish, mm -hmm. you must be planted. And I'm afraid today because we are living in the 21st century, one of the major frustrations of pastors across the country, whenever I sit down and talk with them, had lunch last week when I was in Florida with several friends, the major frustration today is that they say the biggest issue in building ministry is faithfulness. Amen. Uh, uh, we, 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 we love to enjoy, we love to worship, we love to come, and we love to gather. But when God measures you, he does not measure you by the measurements that we look at in society. He measures you through faithfulness. We know I could spend a whole hour or so on what turns God off. We know pride that turns him off. Uh, the pride of life. That turns them off. Uh, uh, we, we can spend all day long on the condemnation and the sin that turns him off. But I'd like to know what turns 
Come on. Uh, so, so the question becomes, is it faithfulness? Or is it fruitfulness? I want you to wrestle with me now. I want you to wrestle with me. I want you to wrestle with me. Notice now the psalmist continues to say uh, 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 that they shall bear fruit, verse 14, in old age, and they shall be fresh. Everybody say fresh. Fresh. And flourishing. Now, now, what I want us to recognize and understand is that when he says literally, those who are planted mm -hmm. in the house of the Lord shall flourish, it speaks both of fruitfulness and faithfulness. I'm going to really discern the difference in just a second. Now, 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 notice Jesus comes very craftily and strategically as he sits with his disciples. You will find that there are, in the Gospel of John, seven I am statements. Seven I am statements. And he addresses something that is very, very important. And he begins to discuss with them that he is the true vine. Have you ever, uh, uh, if you if you have a smartphone, how many of you have a smartphone? Rachel, how many of you have a smartphone? You know your phone is smart when it talks to you. Hallelujah. Uh, how many of you have a smartphone? Have you ever lost signal? You be on the phone somewhere and the phone just black out. Uh, uh, and, and, you, and you get a, a message on your phone that will say call failed. Uh, or sometimes you will lose your connection with Wi-Fi. If you're trying to get some extra things done or you want to download an app or anything like that, you need Wi-Fi to get that done. And, and, and at the core of it is connection. When you lose your connection, the call dies. When your phone loses power, it dies. There is a battery at the source of the phone that powers the phone. As a believer, there are some things that keep you powered. Yeah. There are some things that keep you connected. And when we look at what God delights, he delights in faithfulness. <laughs> look at someone and say, you gotta be faithful now. You gotta be faithful. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So, so, so let's, let's, let's wrestle some more with this. Let's wrestle some more with this. Uh, uh, because I want us to look at some things that he says specifically to his disciples. And he reminds them uh, uh, that a branch must submit to pruning. That is the discipline of the father for the believer. And see, sometimes when tragedy strikes, when adversity strikes, when trials strike, when circumstances strike, that we do not anticipate it can only almost seem as if God is absent. But what if he's just pruning you? Because he says clearly, hear me clearly, I am the true vine. And every branch that does not bear fruit, I take away. So anything that does not produce fruit, is not of God. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And I have to really get down into this because I want you to become aware so that you can be planted and established and then flourish. Everybody say, I got to be planted and established so that I can flourish. Now notice now, uh, 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 what happens when we understand, uh, 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 if, if, if God is turned on by our faithfulness, is it directly just our faithfulness or is it also our fruitfulness? I want you to wrestle with me in this. Notice something. The first thing I want us to look at is that faithfulness is the path to fruitfulness. Uh, uh, Sister Marissa, faithfulness is the path to fruitfulness. Uh, which means that as I am faithful. That's why Jesus tells the disciples and says, if you are faithful over a few things, I will make you ruler over many. God will never, hear me clearly, God will never bless you with what you cannot manage. If you cannot manage where you are, he cannot take you where you're going. But that's why he gives us the ability and the understanding that you have to be faithful with where you are. 
to step into fruitfulness. Are you hearing me this far? Yes. Hallelujah. It's right, it's gonna help you. It's gonna help you. I promise it's gonna help you. You're gonna think about something I said today. Now, uh, 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 the second thing you must understand: faithfulness will always result in fruitfulness. Yes. Faithfulness will always result in fruitfulness. Why do you say that, preacher? Because he says clearly, look at the scripture. Uh, uh, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Which means that because you are in me, when I speak to you, my word washes you. And that's some good news for somebody in here this morning. Because despite where you've been in your life, and despite the circumstances that have happened to you, and despite the moments in which you felt as if you were living in an actual nightmare, he says, when I speak to you, my words wash you, and you are therefore washed in the water of the word. But when the word gets in you, it transforms you. That's how you know the difference between a fruitful person and an unfruitful person because when you are fruitful there will be a side of your fruitfulness. Oh everybody today in the 21st century loves to say that they have some sort of religious affiliation. If you go throughout New York City they'll say that they love God, they may not do church and they love this and they love that but I want you to understand that when you have a relationship with God it is not just based off of good works. It is not just based on how many things you've done, but God measures your faithfulness. God measures your fruitfulness. And the question becomes, are you bearing fruit? <laughs> now watch this now. Watch, this, but watch what happens. Now watch what happens. Watch what happens. It is faithfulness that always results in fruitfulness. The New Testament has no category. Watch this, Earl. The New Testament has no category for a fruitless Christian. Because anything that is healthy must grow. Yes. Uh, uh, if you have a if you have a seed, you plant that seed in the ground. You till the ground. You water the seed. Something better bug. Otherwise, you're going to go take it out the ground and go back to this person that sold it to you and say, listen, I don't know where you got this seed from, but something wrong with this thing. You expect the plant to grow. If, if, if I did the illustration a long time ago, uh, uh, at, at, when we were at an old building, uh, 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 I don't know if Emmanuel remember it. Uh, if, if, if Emmanuel or, or, or Reuben, one of them stood right here, they don't have to literally, if one of those children stood right here in front of me, and they were the exact same size 10 years from now, something would be wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a baby, and that baby stays that exact same size five years from now, you know that there's something wrong. They normally call that dwarfism. Why do we have dwarfism in the church? Well, we stay in one place a long time, and we never bear forth fruit. Notice now, notice now, that's why he says, that's why he says, uh, 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 anything, I'm almost finished, I'm almost finished, anything that bears for fruit, I, 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 I have I have prepared it. So, so in essence, what I'm saying to you this morning, the mere fact that you felt the way you have is because he's pruning the branches. Even when it gets dark, he's pruning the branches. Uh, I know it does not feel comfortable at times, and I know it feels as if you've been abandoned, and I know that circumstances are getting crazy, and I know that things are happening, but God wants to know, will you trust me? Will you be faithful? Because if you are faithful, while you may be frustrated, I will make you fruitful and you have to get to the place in which you know even though I don't see it yet I know he's promised me something. Is there anybody here this morning that knows that God has promised you something? You may not see it yet. You may not have it yet but you know that you know that you know that you know on the inside there is something on the way for your life. God says be where you are and when you're faithful where you are I'll open the door so that you might be truthful. Amen. 
Amen. Third thing we must understand, I'm closing. Faithfulness is a form of fruitfulness. Mm -hmm. Because it is one of the fruits that God produces in us. And we must understand that another form of fruitfulness, and this is what God really wanted me to talk to you about this morning. Another form of fruitfulness is character. I was watching something, I've been taking this class online uh, uh, called uh, uh, Christian Worldviews. It's a worldview class talking about worldviews. And, and I want you to hear this specifically this morning. And it, and it talks about how uh, uh, the reason why we have some of the issues and challenges we have today is because there is a present crisis of truth. And they said that immediately as soon as our nation emerged into uh, a no longer believing in absolute truth and making truth relative or whatever a person desires to believe, we call that perspective postmodernism, uh, we understand that the crisis of truth also correlates to a crisis of character. So what the writer was saying is, and it's baffled me for saying, I want you to hear this. He said, he said that as we move to a nation that no longer believe in sovereign truth, we also moved away from character. He said so that as character, as truth walked out the room, so did character and morals and leadership. Why is this important? He says because it is by us no longer recognizing truth that we are now seeing an erosion in our nation. I tell you, if you look on the screen, every other week you're finding political persons failing and people accepting bribes and all kinds of things going on uh, because we are seeing today an erosion of character. Dr. Navarro recently wrote a book on character because we are no longer seeing godly character. Yes, mistakes happen. Yes, things happen. But you must understand that as you are planted and being faithful, there your gift, I said this in the ship text the other day, your gift may make room for you, but your character keeps you in the room. Yes, sir. Thank you. So, yes. uh, we must understand that fruitfulness includes faithfulness. So God is turned on by our faithfulness, yes. but not just our faithfulness, our fruitfulness. Because fruitfulness and faithfulness go hand in hand. And that is why the psalmist says, you will bear fruit <laughs> in old age. Promise, next time I preach it the way I want to. You will bear fruit in old age. Why is it that he says, hear me clearly, why is it that he says, hallelujah, that you will bear fruit in old age, Trevor? He says you will bear fruit in old age because Israel as a nation had no fruit. Israel as a nation were fruitless because they were at a period and a moment in which while in captivity, they had turned their backs on God. <laughs> so when you look in the old covenant, I wish I could preach it the way I want to. In the old covenant, you will find that there was no fruit. And as a result, they also had no hope. But then when you get in the new covenant, Jesus says, I am the vine. Which means you no longer have to look for a solution. I'm going to stand at the influx of the middle between the old covenant and the new covenant by standing on the cross. That's why out of the window home said, there is no thing that loses its youth except a tree and truth. The cross is made of a tree. I would argue this morning, it stands horizontally for grace and it stands vertical for truth. So that when Jesus hangs on the cross, the truth can make you free. And while he stands on the cross, he moves from the old covenant, steps in the new covenant and said, if you abide in me, I'll make you free. You might have been fruitless on one end, but you'll be fruitful when you step in me. What does this nation need? Not more intellectual, not more psychology, not all these other senses of things. We need to get back to the old-fashioned gospel of Jesus Christ until lives are changed, until minds are delivered, until hearts are set free. We have to get back to the basics of what it means to be a believer and that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow every tongue shall confess that he is Lord I'm getting ready to close but look at your neighbor and say neighbor are you fruitful are you fruitful that's why the very first thing God said when he looked back at Adam he said be fruitful and multiply so my 